Well, thank you. It's really an honor to be here uh, with this distinguished group tonight and with all of you. I really need to thank all of you for making me feel really, really nervous. There's a tremendous amount of energy that comes when you feel really nervous. So hopefully that energy will transfer uh, into a good presentation. The other warning I have to give at the start is that, uh, as my kids will tell you, I'm not really that funny. So we've heard some good jokes tonight, but I, I do care deeply about creativity. And so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And uh, to start with, I want to talk, I want to start with this wonderful quote from one of my favorite authors, Annie Dillard. And in one of her novels, she wrote, no child on earth was ever meant to be ordinary. And you can see it in them and they know it too. But then the times get to them and they wear out their brains, learning what folks expect and spend their strength trying to rise over those same folks. In 1968, George Land did a study for NASA. They commissioned him to figure out how to find the most creative kids because they wanted to attract those kids into their programs. So he developed this test that would measure creativity. He actually talked about this, this uh, study that he did at a TEDx event in Tucson. Uh, what he found after studying over 1,600 kids was that from age three to five, 98% of the children tested at a genius level of creativity. What does that mean? Almost every single child born has a genius level of creativity within them. By 10 years of age, that number had dropped to 30% that tested at a genius level. By age 15, that number was down to 12%. And then he thought, well, what about adults? What happens to adults? Right? Any guesses? <laughs> 2% of us <laughs> by age 30 managed to hang on to that genius level of creativity. The rest of us, what do we do? We wear out our brains trying to rise above mediocrity, right? That's, <laughs> that's how we lose it. Well, what does that mean? What you see, I think, is a pattern here. It's, it's almost a life cycle of creativity within each one of us. And what I've seen is I've looked at creative movements, which is really just a collective effort to engage creativity as a power to produce something. Uh, you see this same cycle and the same ebb happen as, as creative movements are young and then as they start to get older. Okay? So what's the importance? Why, you know, why even bring this up tonight? We, you know, why is it an, an idea that's, that's important to talk about? Well, whether you want to someday maybe get elected for office. Uh, maybe you want to start your own visionary company. Uh, perhaps you have ambitions to change the way the PTA operates. Uh, or, or maybe you just want to try and preserve the, the creativity of your own kids and try to keep them in that, uh, that 2%. You know, whatever it is, you're going to need to understand how creative movements work because that's going to influence, the more we understand about this life cycle, the more that we can deliberately engage that life cycle for our own creative purposes and missions in life. So a creative life cycle, it always starts with a vision, right? It's the moment of inspiration. It's that, it's that creative epiphany when that aha moment strikes. And it usually comes to a single person or a very small group of people after very intense deliberation and thought into a matter, and usually it comes in direct opposition to the mainstream ideas of the day. Right? They're usually acting in direct opposition. Well, that vision then has to spread. If it's going to really be born into a movement, the, the founders of that vision are going to spread that vision to others, either by design, where they purposely do it, or simply by example, they'll start to influence others who see this, the tremendous potential that that idea opens up to them. And so they get, in, they get really enthusiastic, they get all this energy, and they see an influx of their own creativity to do something new, to try something new, to do something innovative. And then it spreads to their friends and the people that they know, and you start to see a movement being born. Well, as more and more people are drawn to a creative movement, you reach a phase where you have to organize them. If you're going to actually try and accomplish a greater purpose, then you need to start to organize this movement so it can have identity, so it can have purpose, so that even the, the members of the movement can stay informed of what kind of creative uh, ideas are coming out of it. So it will start to develop organization. And then as it becomes organized, what you're going to see is the rise of bureaucracy, and you're covering my IR over there with your hand, sorry. <laughs> 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 
So what you're going to see is the more and more organization you get, then you get the rise of bureaucracy. And, uh, and bureaucracy is the death of creativity. They're, they're like the polar opposites on the spectrum. And uh, when a movement enters the bureaucracy phase, some of the symptoms that you're going to see with that, you're going to see a tremendous influx of rules, new commandments, new policies, new regulations, you know, all, all this structure that's going to start to, to try to contain and control the way people think and the way people create things. Uh, another sign of bureaucracy is it starts to attract new members into the movement itself that might be more engaged by the organization itself and less engaged by the founding vision. So they come in and they're more, they're more drawn to the organization and, uh, and, and that leads to a dependency on, on the bureaucracy and the rise of what I call bureaucramentalists. Okay, that's a brand new word, we're inventing it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> What's a bureaucramentalist? Well, it's kind of a, 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 a mesh between a bureaucrat and a fundamentalist, right? It's somebody that is willing to give away their creativity and accept the directions from some higher venerable leader in the movement. They want somebody to tell them what to do. They're in that 98%. They've lost their creative drive. They really find great comfort in having some venerable old leader give them commandments and tell them exactly how to live their life. Uh, opposed to that might be that 2% that maintain that, and what are they going to do? They're going to kick against that bureaucracy, like kicking against pricks, and they're going to try to find a new way to do things which is going to give birth to new visions and new creative movements, and thus new movements are born. Let's look at a couple of examples uh, of this tonight. One of my favorites is an artistic movement that was born uh, in, in the 19th century in France, and this, this was at the time considered the height of artistic achievement. What they had done is in opposition to older styles of art where the human form was just kind of rubbery and it looked like maybe a second grader had drawn it, uh, these guys resurrected some of the ideals of the, of, of the Greek classical figure and they started to perfect the human form. And not only that, but they were trying to still tell these stories of deep historical importance. That was the epitome of perfect art. Right? So you get these classical scenes and these figures rendered with absolute anatomical perfection and they would study for hours and hours and hours trying to learn how to master the human form in two dimensions and I have to admit I was influenced by these guys as an art student myself I wanted to achieve what they achieved I wanted to achieve wanted to achieve pure mastery of the human form so I went to a, a an atelier just like they did and this was one of my pieces that I created uh, it, this was a historical scene of the, the, the rise of the Amistad slave rebellion these were the, this is this painting depicts the moment when the slaves were rising up taking over the Amistad slave ship and killing their their Spanish captors right and and uh, so I was influenced by this movement but like all movements what happened to this movement in in France well all these rules and regulations kind of poured forth of, of how art could be created. They were controlling the pigments that artists could use, even sometimes the paint brushes, the scenes, the composition, everything had rules as to how it had to be operated. Well, there rose up a group of people that kind of got tired of that, and uh, they were the, called the Impressionists. They had a new vision of what art could be. They had a vision of art that was going to be filled with light, and these scenes of everyday life with thick, thick paint on the surface of the canvas and all these deep, saturated colors. Well, guess what? That movement went on to become probably the most influential movement of all art. It spread not only from painters, but it spread into the writings of the day. It spread into plays and theater. Uh, it spread into music as well. That, that, impressionist, music, uh, that impressionist, impressionist movement changed uh, the, the history of creativity. So a very powerful outflow out of the ashes of the former. And that, and that cycle continues throughout art history. Uh, you can see that that cycle just continues to cycle through. What about business? Okay, now let's, let's start with the company that probably most of us know, <laughs> uh, Apple. Let's talk about the, the rise of Apple as a creative movement tonight. Well, these two, uh, these two innovators, they had a vision in opposition to the, the theory that Computers were really meant for big business. There were these gigantic machines the size of this room, and they were meant for large-scale computing of really important tasks. Well, these, these two innovators, they thought their vision was, let's create 
a computer device for, for everybody, a personal device that will, we believe will change the way people act, the way people think, right? They launched this product that was going to change the world in their view. Uh, did it spread? Did their product spread throughout the world? Just by raise of hands, how many of you are carrying an Apple device with you tonight? <laughs> Yes, it did spread. Not only that, they organized uh, the biggest company in the world. Just last year, Apple became the largest company uh, in the world. Uh, but what about the bureaucracy? How did they handle bureaucracy? Uh, ironically, when they launched their first product in 1984, they portrayed themselves as the company that was going to break down Big Brother. And they had this tremendous commercial, you know, where this girl comes in and she smashes this screen, and uh, they're going to break. Uh, big Brother. Well, now their critics say that Apple has become the Big Brother that they, were trying, that they set out to destroy. Just another raise of hands. How many of you that use iTunes have ever read the entire contract that governs how you can use that? <laughs> Anybody in here ever read the whole thing? Don't. If you do, it'll scare the pants off of you. Seriously. <laughs> You'll never want to use iTunes again. You're going to think Big Brother is looking over my shoulder. Okay. So they've gone through this uh, cycle as well. Let's look at another example. What about what we're doing tonight? Ted, is Ted a creative movement? Yes. Hell yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> and what are we doing tonight? We're spreading that original vision. Brad laid out that vision with this beautiful monologue at the beginning of the session tonight. He really laid out what the vision was that created Ted. And what are we doing tonight? We're disseminating it. Right? We're participating in this movement and growing it and making it larger. And we're organizing. How much organization does it take for TED event? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Okay. What about bureaucracy? You know, are, is there bureaucracy in TED? I think that we're still early enough. We haven't seen too much bureaucracy entering into this movement yet. But I will tell you that I did get a long list of rules telling me what I should and shouldn't do when I speak tonight. <laughs> So maybe we're starting to touch on that, on that a little bit as well. Uh, how about the world of politics? Okay. Pol political movements, they go, they go fast. You know, that usually starts with a vision, a, a, a vibrant candidate comes out, and it usually is a version of hope or change or innovative leadership. I mean, it's always a, vari a variation of the same, the same vision. They have to disseminate that vision. They have to organize if they're going to get elected. And then if they're successful in creating a creative movement, and they do get elective, what happens? They instantly become bureaucracy. Like overnight, the day they take oath of office, they are the bureaucracy. Boom. And now they've just opened the door for all of their opponents to grab that vision and to take them down. Right, that's how it works. Well, I want to end tonight with, uh, with more of a personal, kind of a personal spin on this, on this cycle. Now, my daughter came to me uh, in the ninth grade. I'm not in the ninth grade, when she was nine years old. And uh, she was very discouraged with the bureaucracy of school. It was just beating her down. She said, Dad, I hate school. It's so boring. I'm not learning anything. They're not challenging me. You know, I just, I don't want to, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, Emma, what do you want to do? She said, well, I, I love telling stories. I want to I tell this fantasy story. We love fantasy at our house. Um, she said, I have this idea for a fantasy story that I want to tell. And I said, well, here's some research that you should do and some preparation that you could do to start telling this fantasy story. And she went away, and I thought, okay, she's gone, you know, she'll, whatever, it'll pass. She came back a month later and threw down this stack of papers on my desk, like hundreds of pages. I'm like, what's this? Oh, well, this is all the research for, for my story, Dad. And we started going through this. There were drawings of characters. Uh, there were... Ah, your shoulder's in the way again. <laughs> Darn this uh, beam of light that I have to use. <laughs> but she came back with ideas for characters, and not only characters, but like genealogies for like 10 generations of their history, of how they had come from, the civilizations that they had grown in, the politics of all these different groups that were fighting. There was this race of in super intelligent dragons that were going to be in the story, another race of, in of sentient wolves that were going to interact in really dynamic ways with the human races that bordered on their territories. And uh, I was amazed. It was just layer after layer, drawings and maps and ideas. And I thought, wow, I've got a daughter that's clearly still in that 30%. Uh, <laughs> and underlying it all, 
Underlying this whole story was this incredible vision of friends building friendships with new people, learning to trust and overcome their prejudices. It was this vision of how those friends deal when betrayal comes in and how those friends can work to overcome great challenges to achieve their dreams. One of the lines that she had written down is, when you face your greatest fear is when you do the impossible. Wow, that's a vision. And I was hooked. I was a believer right then and there. I said, Emma, what do we have to do? I'm on board. Let's go for it. You know, so we started making drawings of all these things. Uh, we started, we, we, we created this world where all this action is going to take place. We started developing illustrations. She had a timeline drawn out, literally a timeline for 10 volumes of this fantasy series. So we started work on volume one. We started working with all these different uh, scenes. We started writing and uh, literally, here we are almost three years later, we've got 450 pages of volume one done. We're just about ready to, uh, to, to go to light of day with it. And what, do, do I carry, I mean, what if, what if nothing happens to this? Does that matter? To me, no. What I've seen is I've seen the creative genius of my nine-year-old daughter, who's now almost 12, really captivate and create a creative movement. One that drew in me, it drew in our other children. They started contributing to the ideas. Uh, my wife got on, bo got on board, we sit around and we brainstorm and we deal with problems in the plot and the story and we, and we move forward. And that's exciting, uh, that's really exciting. To me, the movement has already achieved its end goal, regardless of wherever it goes uh, from here down forward. So what's the purpose of all this, okay? What's the purpose of looking at the life cycle of creative movements? You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, my, I, would, I would argue, yes, it matters greatly. Okay, when, when the old and worn out movements of our day try to take away your creative genius or the creative genius of your children, I say rise up, say no. We've got to do something about that. We, you need to create a new vision that will inspire others to access their creativity as well. And if we do that, we can change the world, even if it's a world we have to invent on our own. Thank you.